have uh, really come into a very important and interesting space because it's not only about the encounter of someone with a tool to share that can help us to be compassionate or uh, grow in some human way, but we have this marvelous uh, agenda that Dr. Aronson has helped us to sit our feet on, which is our basic attachment in life and our basic attunements in relationship, which we can never, uh, which can never be disappeared, because it is part of our memory and our psyche. And uh, so, whether he wants to talk about psychodynamics of two people in the room, or a family in a room or a milieu, or a classroom, or a meditation hall, or separated by a screen from someone else, but they are there. Uh, whether it is nonverbal, whether it is verbal, etc., this has all now come into the agenda of what is being transmitted in mindfulness. So I hope that our two speakers can comment on this uh, in a broader way. Uh, because uh, I think uh, you have introduced some really uh, very important and basic uh, questions about where we put this. It's not a manualized um, m mindfulness that we're talking about anymore. Um, you know, Patel was, uh, Patel, when he was here, would talk about the Buddha syndrome as being the enmeshed Buddha was with his family and he had to leave his, you know, his mother and uh, go out into the world, and he calls this the Buddha syndrome, uh, because it's based on uh, uh, on enmeshment of uh, Indian mothers with their sons. So you know, there's many ways of going through these doors. Um, so I would really like our speakers to comment on, and Cecile Rousseau, uh, and another child psychiatrist, because we're both child psychiatrists, and very intrigued by your discourse. I uh, wanted to, you to both uh, our speakers to comment on these questions. I'm sure there's lots of uh, questions from the floor, too. So do, you, do you want to start with a comment? Well, you raise the issue of um, who delivers the message. Um, you know, there's one, I'm a kind of a addicted reader and studier, and so one of the, my recent addiction, addictive readings is a field called relational psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Um, and what's exciting there is there's, um, see one of the things that I think is, like if you look at the classical model of Buddhist practice, it's what I would call it unidirectional. I am creating compassion as almost like a radio signal that's going out, compassion, and I'm, I'm sort of sending it out. And a lot of the research in the uh, interpersonalists and the relational psychoanalysts are, are looking at the, and also the early attachment theory, is looking at the incredible subtle dance that is occurring between infants and parents and that occur is occurring between therapists and clients and between humans. And so um, I'm very, very excited about, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that in terms of psychology, we talk in Buddhism about dependence and interdependence and the complexity of interdependence. And, and interestingly enough, I think that by the time things got to China and ultimately Japan, they sort of, I think, actually get in, in some ways interdependence in some ways that maybe India and Tibetan Buddhism didn't. I mean, they get it, but the the whole Chendai and Huayan and you know, where like the Avatamsaka Sutra, which exists in Tibetan, but I don't know that they make, I mean, it's there, and in some of the practices, it's actually very, very there, but the, the idea, and, and, but you know, modern psychotherapists have actually adopted some of this as almost a model of human interaction, and now there's, there's actually the empirical study where people can do these film things where you're, you're seeing the mother's eyeball start expanding and the child's smile is starting to expand and within 500 milliseconds of each other. And uh, the reciprocal co-constructed nature of human relationships is just like a miracle. And so that is just very, very exciting to me, but it, it speaks to, I think if we're developing something like compassion, it's gonna have a very, very wonderful effect, but I think we need to keep our eyes open to the fact that this is a kind of, uh, field that we create and 
we're going to be sending something out, something's going to be coming back. One of the reasons why I'm very excited about um, recent research in compassion meditation is the fact that it's uh, a, a very relational style of practice, um, that uh, mindfulness can be practiced in a, in a very uh, kind of individual way, but these are styles of meditation, uh, meta-meditation also in the four measurables, very relational styles of meditation. And because um, social interaction is so fundamental to us, um, as evidenced by the things I mentioned and also by, by attachment theory and Bowlby. Um, I think that's tapping into something very powerful. Um, and so I'm excited that, that the research on meditation is ex expanding in these different directions. I also wanted to say that um, I, I didn't really get a chance to say it that clearly in my talk, but in terms of the elephant in the room about religion, um, you know, it has been kind of hanging in the background there, and I think right from the very beginning with Professor Scharf's talk about perennialism, um, I, I, I can't speak to um, the experience of ultimate reality that uh, Harvey was getting at, but I think that um, even in, in, in less elevated, in a less elevated sense, religion is, is kind of there in the sense that um, in my experience, um, I wear many different hats. So I'm both a researcher on CBCT, but I'm also an instructor. And in some of the classes, um, you know, in teaching, because more, you could say more Buddhist teachings are there in a practice like CBCT than in, say, a mindfulness-based practice. So you're talking about interdependence, but you're also talking about how a behavior is driven by certain afflictive emotions and, and ignorance and so forth. And so, and it's also very discussion oriented. So some of the things that come up in the classes are questions about free will, about um, evil, about justice. And there are elements of, of the Buddhist practice there that I think even though it's being offered in a secular form, it's undermining certain beliefs about um, free will, for example, as an uncaused choice, you know, that I have this ability to, and, and therefore other people have this ability to freely choose between right and wrong, and so if they choose to engage in wrong um, actions, then they're evil, and there are evil people out there in the world, and therefore you should, you know, uh, and it's kind of, you know, that might be a limit on your compassion and so forth. So trying to understand that on a deeper level, I think, uh, is actually, there is content there that can very much come into conflict with um, people who are coming from other religious traditions, um, where that might be actually a central aspect of their theology or their worldview. And uh, because, as I mentioned, most of the people who are coming in to our classes are not Buddhist, there's maybe a very high chance of that happening. And so one question is, is engaging in a practice like this, is it actually changing their religious worldview? Is it changing their value system in, in a way? Um, and um, Chicago actually uh, just got a grant from the Mind and Life Institute to study, to do an ethnographic study to try and get some, at some of those issues because it's very hard just through a kind of straight scientific, you know, hard science methodology to get at those kinds of things. But I think that's a very important question. And if that's happening, then, you know, ha, ha, you know we're trying to say these are secular practices, but if we're changing people's religious beliefs, uh, that's a thorny issue, uh, I think, you know. So I don't know how to deal with that, really. Well, thank you for a very nice presentation. It was a very interesting day. Um, you were mentioning uh, old psychoanalysts. Let me go in the same way. So uh, Freud, in writing a letter to his friend uh, Fleece, uh, was begging him, please let me introduce a bit of obscurity in your clarity. Uh, that's what I'll do, addressing the shadow. Uh, it's when we speak of attachment, of negative attachment in Buddhism, and I was rethinking that it goes to what Jaswant was proposing in the, the Buddhist Torah story, too. Is it really different from the attachment of Baldi? And I would propose probably not. Probably what the negative attachment and the positive attachment are two faces of the same coin and belong. You know, so what, how attachment can be very negative and very positive uh, at the same time. 
Uh, meditation, we heard this morning, I think it was very interesting. It's very popular now. When is it self-absorption? Uh, when is it openness to the other? Uh, and when is it both? I think the, the whole movement between those two faces, uh, is it always good? Is it good and bad? Or when? And I think that that, that movement to me is quite important. Um, attachment, again, uh, just to go back, uh, this woman from El Salvador, which had suffered, tortured, and she told me, you know, she had a terrible childhood. And, and she told me, you know, I survived because I knew how to suffer. I had to learn it. Um, so th the whole movement is also present on the discourse on compassion. Uh, I've heard wonderful discourse on compassion and immigration judges uh, here in Canada. They were utterly racist. But, but they were speaking about compassion in such a lovely way. Uh, I hear discourse on compassion in my professional colleagues, but they won't accept to treat uninsured patient, undocumented patient. Uh, if you look at the, the and I, we've worked with in school during the Iraq war, and, and building awareness of the other and empathy and double empathy is something very important and I appreciate your work. But it's something utterly difficult. And it's not something which happened in a vacuum of power. And Elaine Pinderius, who worked with the black community in the States, uh, really posed a question, teaching empathy, teaching compassion. It's, it's a noble enterprise. It's something we, we, we need to do. Uh, but is it possible? And where is the limit? Uh, and, and, uh, and it happens in, uh, within power relation. And I think that from the little I know of Buddhist uh, teaching, it's there too that you should acknowledge that when you teach it. Power relation is about who, who represents what uh, and what's happening. Uh, compassion doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in a situation where there are privileges, where there are hurt, where there are all of that. And how do we factor that in the equation? In the equation, it's not easy to factor because, because it's so present. So who will, for example, master the fire? The, the forest rangers, which do have a certain power in society, or, or the Mohawk, or the Mi'kmaq, or the, or the people who used to master the forest but are unknown, invisible. It's about how, we, how do we shape things. Is, is, so I believe very much in what you're saying, and I think it's fantastic work in the school, and it's not easy work. Uh, what I'm just bringing is when you when we envision and we want, and I share that dream to, to become, and I think this is therapeutic, to become better human beings, I think that we need to keep our doubts at the same time. Hey, thank you, Cecilia. Now she's open to questions. Yes. I would add one co complicator to that, and that is, I, I don't know that I would agree that what you presented would be the traditional Tibetan Buddhist presentation of an ethical universe. I think, in fact, traditional Tibetan Buddhism was right and wrong oriented. What you're presenting may be a His Holiness inspired version of ethics or a Western liberal inspired view of ethics or even more so a psychologically informed view of ethics which I personally value but from what I hear from people about traditional Tibet it was rule driven it wasn't empathy driven <laughs> yes. 
Um, they might they might not have lived up to their own ideals, though. I mean, that's a possibility also. That's right. And if I could just say a brief word of clarification on that. That um, measure is the MacArthur Story Stem Battery, and it's a, it's, a, it's a measure that's been used in developmental psychology for, I think, over 40 years, maybe even 50 years. So we didn't create that measure. And the measure is um, sensitive to the idea that it, it's trying to look at moral development and moral reasoning in children. And it's not, uh, it might have been over, overly simplistic in the way I presented it, that it's just moving from rules-based to you know, empathy-based moral reasoning. It's much more it's sophisticated. A real cosmology. We can, we can well, if, if there is, it's not a Buddhist cosmology because the scale wasn't developed by Buddhists. That's the only <laughs> So, I mean, you know, we're, we're not trying to create a set of Buddhist measures, you know, to assess the effectiveness of the, to, to the greatest extent possible, we're trying to look at research that is, is much broader and more neutral with regard to religion, you know. I think there's, um, uh, you know, there, there's a growing awareness. I kind of alluded to this that um, that uh, positive uh, emotions and uh, positive traits like gratitude, compassion, um, and so on, um, self-discipline, for example, that these are very connected with positive mental health and human flourishing, and. Um, some of the scales, like the scale that Chicago used, uh, that we used in the Nikon study, the mental health continuum, um, have uh, have been used in studies that show that you know give very powerful um, evidence suggesting that having positive mental health, not merely just the absence of mental disease, but actually having a life that is um, uh, characterized by constructive traits and emotions and functioning and so forth, is um, a better indicator, actually, of whether a person is going to get uh, depression or mental illness in 10 years than their current um, than a current diagnosis of depression, for example, is a better indicator of um, suicidality um, than current levels of depression and so forth. So, I mean, so there, so uh, from a mental health perspective, there is a strong reason to think that the promotion of uh, these positive emotions and character traits uh, is, is very healthy, even on an individual level. When you think on a social level, the benefits of impartiality and uh, compassion and so forth, um, I think we can all kind of, uh, you know, Bajinder's um, presentation, you know, about peace, how do we get towards uh, societies that are characterized more by peace and so forth. I think there's a rationale from that side, too.
As a Tibetan Buddhist, I'd say everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm in a tradition where it, blessings of the teacher, the blessings of the Buddha, blessings of the lineage are 98% of practice. Uh, so to secularize that is quite a trick, but people do it. Uh, but, you know, I, I, for me, it's, it's uh, I mean, maybe I'll tell this story now. I was saving it for another time, but I'll say it, tell it. When I was in India, I was in Ladakhi Bodh Vihar in Sarnath, and this wizened old lady came up to me and asked me for two Band-Aids. And I gave her two Band-Aids, and the next day, I saw the Band-Aids were on her temples. And I figured out later that she was using the Band-Aids for her headaches. And uh, she understood that Band-Aids were for pain, and therefore putting them on her temp temples would be a great solution. To some extent, I feel that what's happened with mindfulness is a little bit <laughs> akin <laughs> to that so process. Yeah. And she probably got over her headache, and I think we're getting over a lot of our headaches, and I think it's a wonderful tradition. But the, it's like we've taken this Volkswagen engine out of the Volkswagen, we've put it into Lord knows what. And it's a kind of a strange experience, especially for like a diehard Buddhist. You know, it's very, very unusual. And so uh, I think, you know, what you're asking, yeah, I mean, the Buddhist cosmology is not the modern world secular cosmology. It is not. And, you know, I, I sort of, I'm on this tightrope, and I'm always sort of looking right, and I'm looking left, and they're very, very different worlds. And, you know, we're of a generation where we learn languages, and we, we studied with teachers who were out after 1959, and we were blessed to do that. But, you know, a lot of people now come into these traditions, and their understanding of Buddhism is MBSR. It's not Buddhism. It is not Buddhism. Buddhism.